In the, in the screen, the title of my presentation is The Origin of Life on Earth, Nature's Agency and or Divine Intervention. And as you may infer from the title, this presentation will deal with the relationship between science and religion. And in particular, the subject I would like to address is to what extent science can provide us evidence about the existence of a creator God. And I think that the origin of life on Earth constitutes a very suitable subject to analyze this issue. Let me start with a quotation of the very prestigious scientist Stuart Kaufman. whom I am sure most of you know. In his book entitled Reinventing the Sacred, a New View of Science, Reason, and Religion, Kaufman states the following, and I quote, life is a natural emergent expression of the routine creativity of the universe. To the devout who require that a creator God have brought it forth, science says, wait, we are coming to understand how is it how it all arose naturally with no creator's hand. Well, end of the quote. Some relevant questions regarding this assertion are the following. Can science really tell us whether the creator had a role in the origin of life? Did, science, did life arise as a result of a pure natural phenomena or by a miraculous intervention of God? Is it conceivable that life may have started by natural causes, although in fulfillment of a supernatural plan? Perhaps the most prominent manifestation of the creative power of nature is the origin of life on Earth. From a scientific standpoint, this subject remains one of the biggest challenges of contemporary research. Due to our lack of knowledge, this field is full of controversies such as panspermia versus origin on Earth, metabolism first versus RNA world, initial heterotroph heterotrophy versus initial autotrophy. Of course, heterotrophy um, implies organisms that require to be provided with the nutrients versus autotrophy are organisms that are required to fix, to fix carbon and to, buy them, to provide themselves the nutrients. Origin in a primordial soup versus origin in hydrothermal vents, determinism versus chance, etc. On the other hand, we must be aware that conditions on the primitive Earth were completely different than those of today. Solar radiation was weaker, the atmosphere was deprived of oxygen, the planet was frequently hit by comets, and the closer moon produced abrupt radiations in the tide cycles. The three fundamental questions that are most often addressed when analyzing the origin of life on Earth are those of when, where, and how. With respect to the when, there are isotopic data as well as bacterial microfossils preserved in ancient rocks. Determinations of the ratio of carbon isotopes in 3.7 billion year old sedimentary rocks from Achillea Isle and of sulfur isotopes in the Isua belt, both in Greenland, suggest biological activity. In turn, stromatolites and microfossils from Australia contain conclusive evidence of bacteria that metabolized sulfides 3.4 billion years ago. We can safe, safely state, therefore, that life appeared early on Earth, possibly before the end of the late bombardment about 4 billion years ago. On the other hand, assuming that life started on Earth and did not come from outer space, a possibility that we cannot rule out, the question regarding the most likely scenario remains highly contentious among specialists. Those that are in favor of the so-called primordial soup, among them the late Oparin, Haldane, Miller, and the, the very prestigious Mexican scientist Antonio Lascano, advocate an origin in solution associated to heterotrophic metabolism. In turn, there are scientists that propose an origin on a solid surface of hydrothermal vents, 
in this case associated to autotrophic metabolism. The most eminent among the latter are Günther Westerhäuser with his high on sulfur or pirate world, typically found in hydrothermal vents known as black smokers, and William Martin and Michael Russell for the lost city type vents with conditions that are less extreme than the black smokers. Both theories, the soup and the vents, have some experimental support. There have been also proposals for other scenarios, although they seem to attract fewer followers. And um, among them, uh, aerosols, for example, or hot springs in, in, on, on Earth. The question dealing with the how, nevertheless, is certainly the most essential one. How do chemical components undergo self-organization to give rise to a living entity? Immanuel Kant's reflection on this specific topic serves to illustrate the enormous task it represents to philosophers and scientists. In his critique of judgment, he asserts the following, and I quote, that crude matter should have originally formed itself according to mechanical laws, that life should have sprung from the nature of what is lifeless, that matter should have been able to dispose itself into the form of a self-maintaining purposiveness, this, is rightly, this he rightly declares to be contradictory to reason." And end of quote. In this citation, Kant is referring to the opinion of the German naturalist Blumenbach. One way of approaching this subject of the self-organization is to think about mechanisms. The, there is one that is spontaneous, namely thermodynamically favored, which can be found in situations such as protein folding, formation of vesicles, assembly uh, of uh, viruses, etc. I asked uh, uh, Yona this morning whether ribosomes were self-assembled also, uh, or spontaneously uh, assembled, and, and she said that she wasn't sure. We're not sure about it. It is a complex process. Well, in, in, in any case, in the, in the case of vesicles and, and viruses, etc., these are all amazing uh, molecular structures that elicit admiration for their beauty and functionality, but, but they are not living entities. On the other hand, there are the so-called dissipative structures described by Ilya Prigogine, in which a certain degree of order is attained as long as there is a provision of external energy. Typical examples of the latter are Bernard cells and tornadoes, systems that are enormously simpler than living cells. Even more important, these systems are incapable of maintaining themselves autonomously far, far from equilibrium. There are other models of self-organization, such as towards Kaufmann's metabolic networks and Manfred Huygens' hypercycles. Encompassing high creative value, these models can be simulated in computers but have not yet been reproduced experimentally in the laboratory. One aspect that contributes significantly to our difficulties in understanding life's emergence is its extraordinary complexity. One could theorize that the simplest cell could consist of an informational polymer that self-replicates and replicates also a second polymer involved in the biosynthesis of a lipid membrane that confines both biopolymers. In the screen you may see uh, this uh, very simple cell represented uh, and it is a, I took it from a paper by Sostak, Bartel and Jean Pierluigi Luisi. This minimal cell would require that nucleotide precursors of the biopolymers to be synthesized abiotically using some energy source available. However, extant cells are considerably more complex than the hypothetical primitive cell. For example, the bacterium Mycoplasma genitalium, one of the simplest known to date, cannot thrive with less than 425 genes. It seems that life as we know it possesses a complexity threshold. On the other hand, the metabolism-genetics duality that is essential to life contributes significantly to this complexity. It is possible that the informational polymers may have preceded metabolism in a kind of RNA world, even though the self-replication of these polymers appears problematic. The opposite is also possible, namely, that a rudimentary metabolism preceded an RNA world. Whichever may have been the case, could self-replicating polymers be considered alive? 
Conversely, would a system of a chemi chemical reaction supported by some kind of energy that lacks informational polymers be considered to have life? In any event, even though the birth of life may have proceeded through stages of lesser complexity, it is hard to believe that it suddenly started by chance. It seems more logical to think that once certain environmental conditions were attained, there were successive steps preparatory to the change which resulted in the appearance of life, all fully complying with the laws of physics and chemistry. However, this way of reasoning has a caveat. A gradual transition from inner matter to life would require defining the precise moment in which the entity becomes alive, because it would not seem logical to think of half alive or half inert entities. Those who defend a reductionist approach uh, or a reductionist standpoint often manifest that, that life's origin did not require the intervention of a supernatural creator. Stuart Kaufman's citation made earlier is a good example of this principle. There are several others. This sort of reasoning is difficult to understand because the scientific method does not have the power to either confirm or refute God's participation in natural phenomena. Stated in another way, would life have to violate some physical chemical law and therefore seem miraculous to us in order to conclude that it is the work of a creator? A similar epistemological mistake comes about when God is made responsible for a natural process that escapes scientific explanation. This attitude corresponds to the doctrine known as the God of the gaps which paradoxically leads to a gradual decline of God's role as scientific knowledge advances. A contemporary version of this doctrine is the intelligent design movement. On the other hand, there is also the argument of design, also known as the physico-theological or teleological argument. It must not be confused with the intelligent design doctrine just mentioned. The physico-theological argument is founded on the apparent design, order, and purpose observed in nature. Early insinuations regarding a divinity responsible for these attributes were made at Plato, Cicero, and St. Augustine. After the advent of modern science, several scientists have manifested their support to the design argument. Let me quote, for example, Robert Boyle whose interest in matters dealing with theology was as deep as those dealing with chemistry. And I quote him, the vastness, beauty, and orderliness of the heavenly bodies, the excellent structure of animals and plants, and the other phenomena of nature justly induce an intelligent and unprejudiced observer to conclude a supremely powerful, just, and good author. End of quote. Nonetheless, the argument of design is most identified with the English clergyman William Paley, whom early in the 19th century published his most prominent book entitled Natural Theology or Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity Collected from the Appearances of Nature. In this work, which is well known, Paley expresses his amazement with the extraordinary complexity of living beings and of biological processes. Such complexity and perfection, he reckoned, could not have arisen by pure chance. Instead, they are a clear manifestation of design. Since there cannot be design without a designer, contrivance without a contriver, order without choice or arrangement without anything capable of arranging, this con they constitute the proof of the work of an intelligent creator. This way of reasoning in relation to the argument of, the, of design brings to mind passages of the Holy Scriptures, such as, uh, for from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of, creator, of their creator, taken from wisdom. And the famous uh, from, from Romans uh, by Paul, for since the creation of the world's God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. Well-known philosophers, among them David Hume and Immanuel Kant, have criticized the argument of design. More recently, the theological argument has been censured by Francisco Ayala and Richard Dawkins, among others, among many. 
In a paper published in PNAS a few years ago, Ayala states the following, and I quote, it was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the complex organization and functionality of living beings can be explained as a result of a natural process, natural selection, without any need to resort to a creator or to other external agent, end of quote. Although it is legitimate to disagree with the argument of design on philosophical grounds, one cannot affirm that Darwin proved the teleological argument to be mistaken, simply because the latter does not deal with the natural mechanisms leading to the apparent design. For this same reason, one can neither argue that the argument of design contradicts Darwin. Unfortunately, contemporary debates on this subject most often fail to make this epistemological distinction. Even Darwin himself succumbed to the allure of thinking that the existence of God could be discerned based on scientific criteria. In his autobiography, he mentions that when being young, he considered himself a taste based on the extreme difficulty of conceiving man and the, and the universe as a result of blind chance. However, later in his life, he had come to the conclusion that the old argument from design in nature, given by Pey as given by Paley, had ceased to be valid since the discovery of the law of natural selection. According to the elderly Darwin, quote, there seems to be no more design in the variability of organic beings and the action of natural selection than in the course which the wind blows, end of quote. An authentic conviction on the existence of a divine creator of life and the universe can only be attained after a thorough philosophical reflection. And let me, let me repeat this. An authentic conviction on the existence of a divine creator of life and the universe can only be attained after thorough philosophical reflection, conducted with an open mind, free of prejudice. This brings to mind the frequent invitations made by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI to accompany scientific progress with critical philosophical reasoning as the only way to reach full capacity to access truth and understanding. Should philosophical reflection lead to a belief in a supernatural designer, how does this reconcile with nature's autonomy? St. Thomas Aquinas has proposed a clear mode of reasoning to deal with this issue. According to this philosopher, the radical dependence on God of whatever exists is absolutely compatible with the causality of natural events, since divine causality and causality in nature operate at different levels. This does not imply that a particular event occurs partially in fulfillment of natural causes and partially in fulfillment of nat divine causes. Rather, every event takes place in complete fulfillment of both, each being exerted in its own way. God transcends nature in such a way that even random events appear as such, that is, random events. Thus, nature's autonomy does not challenge divine agency. The International Theological Commission has adopted this doctrine, stating recently that, quote, divine causality and created causality radically differ in kind and not only in degree. Thus, even the outcome of a truly contingent natural process can nonetheless fall within God's providential plan for creation. End of quote. Those of us who believe that there is a creator of life and of the universe think that he acts in the world in accordance to the natural laws designed by him. This belief is a result of a profound conviction that transcends the natural sciences and that offers a meaning to the great harmony that we observe in the cosmos, a belief which is reminiscent of Psalm 104 that says, when you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you, when you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. Thanks for your attention.